Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Congratulations. You have been invited to the White House. The President is going to be there, the Vice President, members of Congress, the White House staff. And you're not just going for a walkthrough tour, you're invited to dinner. The President himself made certain that your name was on the guest list. So, what are you going to wear? Do you have something in the closet that would be good enough for an occasion like this? Your most elegant gown? The sport coat you haven't worn for 10 years, hope it still fits? Do you have something in the closet to wear? Or might you go out and, and rent a suit with a black tie? Or would you spring for a new dress? Wouldn't you want to wear your best if you are invited to the White House? I, I've heard this uh, argument before, uh, this analogy being used to talk about the way that we should dress for church. That if you are invited to God's house, wouldn't you want to wear your very best? And you can kind of understand where that line of thinking uh, comes from, and, and maybe that makes a good point. But, but then again, I've also heard the other side of it too. You know, doesn't God invite you to come as you are? When Jesus told the story of the prodigal son and that young man hit rock bottom, he went back to the father's house, but he didn't stop at men's warehouse on his way to pick up his rental. He came straight from the pig pen with his tattered clothes and bare feet, and the father still ran out to wrap his arms around him to welcome him home. Okay, I can understand that too, right? If God accepts us as we are or invites us to come as we are anyway, well, then maybe church can be a little more casual. And I think that there are uh, definitely some different ways that you could look at it. If, if only God's word had something to say about this issue. I think it's interesting that in the second Bible lesson we had this morning, the Apostle Paul writes to a, a pastor named Timothy, I am writing you these instructions so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. Indeed, the scriptures do say a lot about worship and how we should approach the house of the Lord. But very few of these instructions have anything to do with how we dress or how we should uh, carry, out our, carry ourselves in, in certain outward aspects. It has a lot more to do with the heart. Because in worship, God is a lot more concerned with our heart than he is with the fact that we are able to go through the motions. In fact, if you look back at Israel's history, there was a time where their worship simply became going through the motions. Their heart wasn't in it. They were focused more on what they were doing for the Lord rather than what their Savior God was doing for them. And in that case, the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, stop going to church. Just stop with your offerings and with your prayers. It's useless. He says in Isaiah chapter 1, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Imagine a church service that is so unbearable that God can't even stand it. Right? What kind of church service is that? It's the kind where people are just going through the motions. And so he says, uh, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Imagine that. God telling his people to stop offering the sacrifices. Stop your prayers. Stop your gathering for worship. It's not doing you any good because your heart isn't in it. Right? Isn't that what religious people tend to do? Make, make it more about the religious activity than about the relationship to God? That certainly is an age-old problem. A problem that persisted in, in Israel for many years after Isaiah. Centuries later, Jesus saw the same problem going on when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he told the Pharisees of his day, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So in other words, you can have on your Sunday best and you can bring your offering to the, the Lord just like you did last week and the week before that. You can earn your perfect attendance award, 
But if your heart isn't in the right place and if you're not, if you don't have the right attitude, well, then you are just ill-equipped and unprepared to enter the house of God. And so today we're going to look at some, some Bible passages and some scripture references to, to learn a little bit about what God does expect when we enter into uh, his house. What attitudes should we have in our hearts as we approach the house of the living God? And the first thing that we're going to, to take note of is the fact that it is an honor to be here, right? Just as it would be an honor to be invited to the White House, it is an honor to be invited by God to spend some time in his house. I mean, think about it for a moment. Is that not the highest honor that you can re receive? The God who orchestrated the symphony of life itself, who choreographed the dance of the sun, moon, and stars, the author of all history, the one who holds the eternal fate of every human being who has ever lived in the palm of his hands, he has requested your presence in his house. And he has cleared his schedule to make a recurring meeting with you every single week. What an honor that is. And yet sometimes we often treat it as, a, as an obligation. Just a, another thing that we have to do in our busy schedule. Well, at least then we can make mom happy. Well, at least then I can check off the religious thing I had to do for the week and then I'm good for a while. At least pastor keeps it under an hour on non-communion Sundays anyway. <laughs> but don't you realize what an honor it really is to be here? And, and when you view it in that light, that you are in the presence of God, well, then you can understand why the psalm writer is so dramatic in Psalm 27 when he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Right? That's the one thing he wanted in his life. What, what do you want most in your life? King David had everything, and yet the one thing he <coughs> desired was to be in the house of God, in the presence of the Lord. It's not just one thing you can check off your list of things to do this weekend. It is an absolute honor to be here. And while it is an honor and it should not be treated as an obligation, we also have to realize that it's a responsibility. After all, it is one of the commandments. Right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's number three. What does this mean? You remember from your catechism days. Right? We should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. It's a responsibility to be here in God's house, it's a commandment to be gathered around God's word. And because it's a commandment, it was also a responsibility that Jesus took very seriously and fulfilled perfectly. You heard what he said in our gospel lesson today, right? When his mom and, and Joseph, they didn't know where he was, and so they were frantically looking for him, and then they finally find this, this young boy teaching the teachers in the temple courts, and they say, what's wrong with you? Like, what? where have you been? We've been looking for you everywhere. You remember how Jesus responded, right? Don't you know that I had to be in God's house? I had to be in God's house. He looked at it as a responsibility. And really, it's true for all of us. We have to be in the house of our Father. It's a non-negotiable. It should be non-negotiable for us to be in the house of our Father. Now, I, I know in the past couple of years we've, we've made it very uh, convenient to, to get the message outside of these four walls, and that is a very good thing. For those of you who are watching online, it is a wonderful second option, but you realize that it's just not quite the same. It's like going to Thanksgiving dinner in a Google Hangout with your family. Right? It, it works if it has to, or once in a while, but it just isn't the same as being in God's house together with God's family here. It's our responsibility to be here. And on that note, I, it is a responsibility as God's family to make sure that our, our whole family is here from the least to the greatest. 
You notice that Jesus is just a, a young boy when he's in the temple, saying, I had to be in my father's house. Right? It's our responsibility as a church family to, to bring our children to worship. And it should be a non-negotiable. For those of you who are grandparents, can you imagine inviting your adult children over but telling them, leave your kids at home. Find a babysitter so you can come to my house, right? You're just not going to say that. I don't want them in my house, well, at, at least until they're old enough to sit still. Well, I don't want them in their house, and at least until they learn not to interrupt me, right? No, you would say, bring those grandbabies here because I, I want to squeeze them and hug them and, and love on them because they're my family. Even the youngest are our family. And so it's our responsibility to bring our children here. And why is that so important? Because, well, Paul writes in, in Romans 10, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. It's important for everyone to hear the message. And the prophet Joel told the Israelites hundreds of years before that, he said, call a sacred assembly, Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Right? We have a responsibility to be in God's house. And the third point for us to consider this morning is that when we come to God's house, we are here to hear from him. That's why uh, so many of our, our hymns are not about us, they're about him. So many of our songs and our prayers are filled to the brim with scripture passages and references because we are here to hear from him. That's why the cross is front and center because we are here to hear about the wonderful things that he has done for us in giving us his son, Jesus, to die for us and rise again to assure us that we have a place in his forever house in heaven. You know, in the, the movie, uh, The Sandlot, there is a young boy who swipes a baseball from his stepfather's room. Uh, baseball happens to be signed by Babe Ruth, right? And he takes that ball and he takes it uh, down to the local sandlot where his friends are going to play a game with it, which was a terrible idea, especially considering that one of the kids cranked it over the fence for a home run. And once it went over the fence, they knew they were in trouble because there was no getting that ball back. On the other side of that fence is the biggest, meanest, nastiest dog in town, right? And so much of the movie is spent with them trying to retrieve that ball, coming up with different ways to get it back. But in the end, it ends up chewed up, covered in slobber. The dog claimed it as his own in, in a big pile of other baseballs. So then the young boy has to go and knock on the door of the man who owns that yard, and old man answers the door and invites him to come in, has him sit down and explain kind of what happened, how he took this baseball, and how his stepfather is going to be very upset when he finds out not only that he took it, but now his prized possession is being used as a chew toy. And as fate would have it, this old man was a former professional baseball player Played for the, the 27 Yankees, known as, the, as Murderer's Row. And he had a baseball that was signed by everybody on that team, including Babe Ruth. And he gives the young boy and he says, here, I'll trade you. The boy says, well, mine's all chewed up and this is in, this is in good condition. Yours is way, worth way more than mine now. The old man says, I tell you what, you stop by here once a week, we'll talk baseball, and we'll call it an even trade. Friends, God has made a wonderful trade with us. He has taken our sins and put them on Jesus, and he has taken Christ's righteousness and has given it to us. Doesn't seem like a fair trade, does it? It seems like we're getting a way better end of that deal. Like the young man in the story of the prodigal son, God, God dresses, up in, dresses us up in his own robes of righteousness. He removes the the, the tattered and the dirty clothes, and he gives us the, his robes of righteousness. What a wonderful exchange. And once a week, he invites us back here into God's house, 
so that we can talk to him through our prayers and our hymns and we can hear him speaking through his word. What an exchange. What a God we have. What a house this is. And what a savior we serve and meet with here in his house. God grant it for all of you. Amen.